I just get the height right on this sucker. Okay. Let's do this, shall we? Good morning. Uh, Saturday morning for me, what's the date? The date is the 18th of April. Um, I'm having a cup of coffee, if you want to join me. If uh, it's coffee time for you, or beer time, or whatever you do decide your beverage of choices. Today we're going to jump into some Precision Rifle Q&A. So I reached out to my little Patreon community. Thanks again once the guys for being there. And um, I asked you to basically ask me anything. And we got a few, let me just put this coffee down. We got a few freaking banger questions. Like questions, high level questions. So some of these questions are so good, I'm going to skip them and uh, make complete videos because they deserve a dedicated video. So Tyron, that's actually you. One of your questions, dedicated video. I'm gonna answer the second part of your question, but for the most part, I'm gonna answer all the questions we got here, just a few ones that are good enough questions that they actually deserve a 15 minute video by themselves, which we'll get to after sort of the lockdown. Oh, good. Andy Simpson asks us, any tips on dealing with eye fatigue from looking down the scope so much while shooting? Cheers, thumbs up. Andy, thanks for your question. So pretty much there's a couple of things you can do for eye fatigue. You're specifically talking about eye fatigue. So one of the things I noticed recently when doing some 22 room fire ELR stuff, which is a project I'm super excited about to bring to you guys, is uh, please excuse the birds. As I said, beautiful Saturday morning, so they're all around the property and um, giving us a beautiful song to enjoy a little bit of a backtrack to this video, shall we? So one of the things I noticed is looking through sort of a cheaper optic that I run on my rimfire is that I did struggle a little bit with eye fatigue. Now I'm thinking that I'll be able to solve that problem by upping the quality of the glass. And this is something I actually noticed on a hunting trip. I was spending quite a bit of time looking through the pH's binoculars, um, and uh, when I actually went up to my own Swaro, that I noticed it was so much better just looking through good glass. And I think that's pretty much the main thing you can do to help with that eye fatigue. Obviously the budget doesn't always allow that, but that's I think gonna be the easiest thing. Cause basically what's happening and why we're experiencing eye fatigue, I could actually ask my sister-in-law, she's an optometrist, but if your eye is trying to bring an image into focus that's not crystal clear focus because of the quality of the glass, then there's not really much you can do about that other than giving it a better image to look at and that's going to give you a little bit of, excuse the pun, but relief on your eye. Apparently Chris Kyle, the American sniper, everyone knows that, um, he had this ability to be behind his rifle for extended periods of time without really struggling with fatigue and that was one of the things that made him such a good sniper. Uh, next question, James Brits. Best way to clean the rifle chamber? Plenty of vids on barrel, not much on chamber. Good question, let me get some gear. So these are the little jobbies that I use to clean my actual rifle chamber. So these are like, it's like a mop type thing. It's like a mop type of jobby. Um, what I do with this one is this is the one I actually clean inside the action on the raceways and I basically just spray a little bit of cleaning solvent or in most cases 99% alcohol and I just clean my raceways out of that and I'll give it a little bit of a spin sort of where the bolt and, and the, the lugs lock up and then this one I'd actually put into the chamber itself and very, very gently just give it a little bit of a, of a cleaning. Um, these ones I did pick up from any local gun shop will have something like this. Let me, yeah, so these are actually quite, uh, super tight to get into this little space but once you've got them in there they're in there pretty good and then this one I would usually wrap a little cleaning cloth around that one once I go into the actual chamber super hard to get this camera to focus on that but that should give you a generally good idea of how I clean my actual chamber right cool good question it is something I do every time by the way so when I clean I first clean my barrel and then right at the end before I store my gun, which brings us actually to the next question. Before I store the rifle, I'll quickly mop up anything that potentially got left behind in the chamber slash area where the bolts lock up. And then I maybe even put a little separate one of these on with a tiny bit of oil and just lube up those raceways with a tiny, tiny bit of oil right before storing, storing my rifle. But I'm talking super thin layer. So the next question comes from Bernard Ferreira and Bernard actually asks us, uh, I see your rifles in the safe are upside down. Is there a difference? What is the advantages? So the main reason I do this is because I always run a last little 
um, pats of oil through my rifle and I don't want for whatever reason the rifle standing muzzle up and all of that crap running down into my bolt face and the chamber area so that's pretty much why I store my rifles barrel down the other reason I do this is it optimizes the space in my safe a little bit so think about this the barrel side is very thin at the bottom and they're all sort of leaning in at an angle like this towards the bottom so if you've got all the barrels at the bottom they don't take up that much space um, and versus having the buttstock end at the bottom uh, they generally tends to get a little bit crowded so that's the reasons I store my rifles upside down also if you're running a suppressor and you're leaving your suppressor slash silencer slash uh, solvent collector on the front of your rifle then um, the, you ha might have some stuff cracking off there as it cools down coming back from the range and falling down into your barrel slash chamber area which is something you want to avoid so if you've got a suppressor on either store that rifle facing down so in other words muzzle down obviously this goes without saying but make sure you have sufficient padding or an old piece of carpet or whatever I have like a rubber mat in my safe that I'm not putting it onto metal or any hard surfaces to potentially damage a crown or scratch anything up so I hope that helps right so next question is from Tyron Tyron the first part of your question I'm gonna make a separate video on that that's something I've been planning on to do for a while and then the second part of your question is basically managing my data at a match um, for different dopes so you're asking specifically about a risk coach so in some of my older videos you would notice I've got a little bit of a thing on my hand my whole video series I did in America if you haven't watched that during the lockdown badass videos I'm gonna link that at the end too but if you want to click out click on this and go watch those I loved that trip it was super fun but you'll notice in that trip I'm running a little data card on my arm and basically what it is it's not an actual risk coach I went to Mr. Price Sport which is a cheap sports shop in South Africa and I bought one of those little cell phone things you would put on your bicep and slip your cell phone into and then all I did was I put a little piece of white paper in and then I take a wet Ebrace Cokie um, a pen and I write my actual dope on that now I stopped doing that the biggest reason I stopped doing that is because too many times that I get into a position where I was lying or pushing down or grabbing something and then it would come loose off my sort of forearm area and it's flopping around and I'm struggling with that thing and I have to shoot and it's a mess so basically what I do now I experimented with a bunch of cokies and pens and what writes the best on my hands so before a match this is actually a little bit funny but I actually shaved the hair off my my one hand and uh, so I've got a clean area to write on and just literally just that part there's not much hair there so it's not something like I don't go out to here that would look super funny um, but the time I was sharpening my knives I did which was a mistake um, so I generally just take that little bit of hair off and I write my dope on that and then I've got a little wet wipe that after the stage I just clean that off or sometimes if you get the wet wipe and then on the pant and then you're good to go and then that way as soon as I've got my hand on my scope like this and I'm dialing I can see exactly what I need to dial and I don't have to worry about anything coming off my hand now there are some disadvantages to doing that the amount of information you can fit on this bit is tricky and also it's quite difficult to write on your skin and probably not the healthiest thing in the world to do but it's not something I'm doing on the daily so I'm not too concerned about that um, whereas if you've got a proper wrist coach or you've got a data card on the side of your rifle which could get hung up so there's pros and cons to that too you can add a lot more you can add multiple wind values you can draw a little range card to help you find targets so there are some pros and cons to each generally I try and memorize where my targets are and I try and memorize my dope actually before the stage so I generally know like okay cool 1.8 1.9 uh, 3.5 or whatever the case so I kind of have that sequence memorized and then if I do check on my hand it's just to double check that I've dialed the right dope but the fact that I can start dialing I know where I'm going to and just as I'm getting close to where I need to end just validate okay cool you've got that you've done the right dope that generally helps save a little bit of time right good question thank you and part one of your question is going to be a cool video right Skulk asks a good question Skulk van Jarsveld uh, is it worth rechambering slash setting back in brackets um, a Hawa 6.5 Creedmoor that has 2,000 rounds down the pipe, down the pipe, the pipe, to try regain some accuracy at the cost of some velocity. Hmm, difficult one. Depending on what your gunsmith is going to charge you to do that. So basically, what John is saying, if this is the chamber end of your rifle, to actually cut off here, rechamber that front bit so you can sort of get back 
to your lands and not have to jump the bullet that far. I don't know if it's worth it on a Howard um, Skulk. I I probably wouldn't do it. Not at 2,000 rounds anyway. Um, so my previous 6.5 barrel, I got 3,200 rounds on. It was a Barclight barrel. And I actually went to my gunsmith at about 2,500 rounds and I said, listen, China Bean, is it worth doing this? Is specifically what you're asking now. And he said to me, for what you're gonna get, it's not worth much. And that's saying something, right? Because he's gonna make money doing that. It's not gonna help me a lot. And then I'll be back there for a new barrel or a new rifle in a couple of months anyway, and then he can make money again. So he was saying to me, it's not worth it. So I'm pretty much gonna take his word for it. If it was a super competitive long range rifle, like a seven millimeter wildcat type of thing, and you were at 500 rounds and you desperately wanna have that same jump every time, and it's a barrel that's gonna last you forever, then it's probably worth it. But at the cost that we pick up how a barrel actions for in South Africa, I'm not sure if it's worth it to do it at at 2,000 rounds. Maybe if the, if it was a thousand rounds, it would be a different story. I hope that helps you with your decision. Difficult one nonetheless. Right, John from Down Under, I believe. Is this thing focusing? Yeah, it is focusing. Okay, we're having a little bit of trouble with this camera after I dropped it. So uh, I just wanna make sure it is, it's focusing on my face. Right, John. Hey, I've got a Tika T3X Tac A1 rifle. Badass rifle, John. Uh, and I fired about 800 rounds each through it. I've only ran the ball snake through it, but never tackled the copper fouling. The barrel looks pretty clean when you look down it. Basically, do you need to remove copper? Would it affect accuracy much or not at all if you don't? If you would, what's the best way to do this? Thanks. I pretty much never let my rifles get into that state. I actually had that, funny enough, on my 223 Hawa which I shot the 53 grain VMAXs through for quite some time. And the one day I was cleaning it and I looked down the muzzle end and I could actually see the copper streaks coming out of the rifle. Now, one way to see this is to take a little flashlight, shine it down the muzzle end and actually just try and get your sort of play around with the angle of the light and then you might see it down there. Now, the reason that the copper generally settles at the muzzle end is because when that round is fired, some of that copper thing actually turns into a gas which as it slows down at the end and cools down, it actually settles on the barrel. So that's why you're having copper down the muzzle end more than likely as to the chamber end. So how I tackle the copper fouling is I use a product called ThoroClean. Now ThoroClean is available from bulletcentral.com if you're watching this in America. If you're watching in South Africa, you could pick it up from me. I'm gonna link that down below too. And just for you US guys, I'm gonna link that for you to the US side too. And basically what you do is you apply it with a brush. I have done this on my how to clean a rifle like a pro video and that took care of the problem for me. Generally, I've said this in the past too, I try and have my rifles in the same state every time I go out to the range. So no copper, no carbon. I basically have a clean barrel all of the time. And that sort of just for me gives a repeatable result you know it's everything's always the same i don't have to worry about potential copper fouling giving me more speed or whatever the case may be as the pressures tend to increase so i try and just have everything the same all the time and if i don't think you can really see copper fouling with the naked eye in my case i could see it because it was extreme like i scrubbed my ass off to get it out but really to see copper inside your barrel you need a proper borescope and and I've been advised also not to get one of those because I'm OCD and I'll probably scrub the rifling out of my barrel <laughs> if I had a bore scope. So uh, yeah, I try and just keep my barrel clean all the time to have it in the same condition and I'm not too worried about anything else then because I know it's clean and I know it's a repeatable result for me after every X amount of rounds. Generally after every range session, I'd come home and I clean my rifle straight away. Sometimes there's not time. I would put a little sticker on it and I know, listen, this rifle still needs to be clean so the next day or whatever when I open my safe, because generally I go out and I shoot more than one of the rifles and I shot that one, that one, that one and then I just clamp them all in the vise, which is awesome for cleaning rifles by the way. If you don't have a bench vise, wow, what a great addition. And uh, I just bang it out, clean it, muzzle down in the safe, Bob's your uncle, good to go for next time. Ice cold coffee now, because I talk too much. Um, right, next question. Johan Wolfart asks, by the way, this is not the Johan Wolfart some of you in South Africa would know, this is a different one, um, not the one affiliated to MDT. Johan, also welcome to Patreon, you're brand new here. Um, 
Why did I decide on the 6.5 Pete for my comp rifle? What is your load development process to get low ES and STS? Two questions. You're cheating here a little bit. Um, anyway, so when I built my 6.5 match rifle that you guys see now, I went to the Precision Rifle blog, which is a super cool website. Uh, Cal Zant, I believe, is the, the gentleman who runs it there. He writes the most amazing Precision Rifle articles, super in detail, does a lot of homework, does a lot of surveys on top shooters all around the US. And basically what I did, I went down the list and I was like, listen, what are these guys shooting? What do I think, or, or what does it look like is the best gear? And I basically just used that to build my rifle. I was like, okay, this barrel, this action, this trigger, yada, yada. And uh, obviously they also did that with calibers. Now at the time, the six mil thing was starting to take off, okay? In the US at least. Obviously now all of them almost shoot six mils, the top guys. So I thought about that for quite some time. Was I gonna chamber my rifle in six Creedmoor or sort of a six BR variant? And the big reason I went for um, the six five Creedmoor specifically was because of the competitions we shoot here in South Africa, the match directors in most cases don't have the funds to put target indicators on their, on their targets, okay? So when you're shooting a 105 grand bullet, at 2,900 feet per second at a kilometer and you hit that plate, there's a big difference between hitting it with a 105 grain bullet and hitting it with a 140 grain bullet in terms of what you're seeing in um, how the target is reacting to that impact. The other reason I also went with the 6.5 Creedmoor is when you miss with a 105 grain with, versus missing with a 140 grain bullet, there's a significant difference in the amount of energy delivered and the amount of splash you see. So that also gives me the ability to potentially pick up some shots that I would have maybe missed um, with a little six mil bullet that could just disappear sort of into the shrub where that 140 still gives me a little bit of a poof of smoke or dust to go off that I can make a correction based on. My low development process, I use OCW, optimum charge weight. I've spoken about that in the past. Link that down below too for you guys. That's pretty much how I go about load development to get a low ES and SD. That, my friend, is a separate video, which I'm very excited for. I'm just waiting on a new piece of kit from our friends over at Annealing Made Perfect that should arrive after the lockdown, and then we will jump into how to bring that SD and ES number down. In the meantime, if you want to pick up your APW expander kit, I'm going to link that below for you too because that's gonna make a massive difference right off the bat. Right, so Nico asks a good question. Nico, thanks for your question. Specifically with the 6.5 Creedmoor, why would you rather shoot a lighter bullet than a heavier version that would also have a higher BC? Sorry, I butchered that sentence, but you guys get the idea. And on that note of BC, is the numbers what count the most or should you load develop for a different bullet to determine the best bullet for your specific rifle? In brackets, in short, where do you draw the line between theoretical best and time and effort investing in finding the perfect combination. Now, Niku, that's a flippin' badass, that's an awesome question. So for me personally, I wouldn't go for the lighter bullet. I wouldn't, for example, shoot 123 grain CNR. I've got 100 grain ELDMs for the 6.5. I bought them basically for the joke to see how quick I could shoot them, complete waste of money. Um, they shoot great, but for what I'm doing, it kind of defeats the purpose, right? So I'm always going to go for the heaviest bullet I can get. Not necessarily the heaviest bullet. I could shoot the 153 grain ATIPS, but my barrel might not necessarily stabilize them. So that's why I went for the 140 grain ELDM, specifically for me. The Hornady bullets are always available in South Africa. Depending on where you live, this might be a little bit different for you. But generally, the Hornady bullets, the availability is good wherever you find yourself. Also. The value for money is good. Now, I used to shoot the Burger 140 grain hybrid targets. They were great. They've got a slightly better BC if memory serves, and they're very consistent bullets. But the problem was, one, availability. I couldn't always get them. If I could get them, I needed to buy thousands at a time to make sure that they last me for the barrel. That's quite a capital outlay. One doesn't necessarily always have the funds to buy a barrels worth of bullets. So that's why I switched to the 140 ELDMs because they're always available and I find very little variance between batch to batch. In fact, I actually don't even worry about the batch to batch. Same load, that's what works for me. So I wouldn't shoot a lighter bullet. I would shoot sort of a good bullet for the weight class. So if you're doing 6.5 Creed more 140, 143 is kind of where I would draw the line probably with the ELDX. The benefit of going for the ELDX is you could obviously hunt with that too. 
um, but for me the 140 ELDM has been the sweet spot. Now with regards to the second part of your question, I would sort of choose a bullet once again as I've said that I know I'll always have available and I'll try sort of have my mind set on a bullet before the time I'll look at the options RDF whatever the case may be and I'll say okay cool I would like to shoot that one I know I'm gonna get it at a good price and it's always gonna be available okay and then I try and develop a load for that if I get a load that shoots under half MOA I call it good I really don't try and chase those groups if the rifle does do that wonderful but if it shoots under a half MOA that's where I draw the line of load development honestly because that's more than enough to win most competitions for the type of shooting that I'm doing specifically we're not trying to shoot world record groups at a thousand meters so I just want to have a good solid load that I know is repeatable in my rifle with the least amount of effort so I can get out there, I can train and I can shoot matches. So uh, I don't experiment with different powders, different primers, seating depths is the last thing I kind of work on if I'm having trouble getting the rifle to shoot. But for the most part I follow OCW technique, try a few charge weights, find one with the least vertical dispersion, play a little bit with the seating depth, most cases not necessary even, tighten up that group, call it good and I'll load everything. I'll load 400 rounds for it, put them in the safe, shoot them all out, load all 400 again. I'm not really chasing my lands um, because I've generally not found that necessary with, the, with how I go about load development. To summarize, I wouldn't go for a, for a light bullet to shoot it faster. I don't think that's worth it. So really quick, Nico, I just popped this into my ballistics calculator. So if I shot 100 grain ELDM with the G7BC of 0.194 at 3,150 feet per second, okay, at a target at 600 meters, I would need to dial 3.8 milrad, okay, or milliradian, of elevation and if I had a crosswind let's change the crosswind to 10, 10 kilometers an hour uh, from 90 degrees save okay calculate I would need to hold 1.1 mil to the left uh, of wind now if I change that bullet um, to my 140 ELDM load which is boom over there save done calculate okay I would need to dial an extra bit of elevation so my elevation hold has gone to 4.2 because obviously that bullet's flying slower but here's where the difference in BC comes. My wind hold all of a sudden is 0 0.7 versus 1.1 which is significant so that basically buys you margin of error and that's why I would always go for a higher BC bullet that I can still shoot at a decent speed but for me consistency is everything so if I can shoot it at a decent speed consistently okay low ES low SD then the higher BC bullet is going to give me that margin for error with wind because the elevation number is irrelevant we're dialing that in our optic anyway so whether I'm doing 3.9 or 4.2 elevation makes no real difference to me the wind is everything in this game so uh, the high BC bullet's going to edge you out on that one so I hope that helps just by running the numbers really quickly. Now you guys in lockdown, this is something you could do. Just play around with Sherlock or whatever your ballistic app of choice is and see what the difference is between different bullets. And another thing you could do, take your same bullet and change the wind angle and see what a difference it makes if you slightly underestimate where the wind is coming from. It's significant. So Stan from Down Under says, now that you've shot a little bit with the Manor stock, do you find a comfort difference between the chassis and the modern take on a stock Cheers mate. Great question Stan. So something I've spoken about in the past is the fact how the MDT vertical grip adjusts backwards and forwards. Now I've got pretty small hands and the vertical grip adjusting backwards and forwards for me on the MDT allows me to get a perfect 90 degree trigger pull quite consistently. Now on the manners I basically have to come off the whole stock side of the grip in order to get a 90 degree trigger pull and I don't like that. Now there's nothing wrong with the product. I basically clean that match as you guys saw in, in the video above. Um, I don't think I can link another video, but whatever. The perfect match video, you guys would have seen that. A lot of people watched that. That video actually did surprisingly well. And uh, I love the product. I love how it looks. It's wonderful. But for me, I'm personally gonna, gonna roll that back and go back to shooting either an ACC or um, or something else in the, in the MDT lineup. They've been really good to me. They're obviously a, a partner to the channel so I think it's just a better fit all around um, but I will be keeping my manners compact for some hunting stuff 
down the line. So uh, yeah, thanks for your questions, Dan. And once again, thanks for your support, mate. I really appreciate that. Right, so Arnold from the Netherlands asks us, if you only shoot at 50 and 100 meters lying on a flat surface, would you recommend the Skyport in combination with an Arca rail on the MDT RX chassis, or would it be better to use Picatinny rail? So I would personally, I don't think it matters how the bipod is attached for your specific example, if you're shooting paper at 100 or 50 meters. And um, cause the Arca basically just gives you that modularity in a match environment. If you're shooting over a log or a barrel or something and you need to quickly adjust the, the sort of where the bipod sits on the forend. And um, specifically with regards to the RX, if you look at the forend of the RX, it's not level. The RX actually has a little bit of a bend as we come towards the magwell um, and that's going to make it difficult to put an arc rail on that. It can be done, I've got an arc rail on my RX but you have to pull that sucker in basically and you don't get that perfect little, it doesn't glide because obviously the arc rail is going to bend with the chassis. Um, but for the most part, <clears throat> if you're shooting groups at 100 meters, I would recommend just going for uh, Atlas Bipod and uh, getting something that doesn't break the bank. If you're going to go Skypod, it's a very expensive piece of kit. It's a badass piece of kit um, and it's extremely adjustable. I do like the fact when I shoot groups with it that I can go to the lowest setting and have those legs come out super wide and not necessarily work with this angle that I have to work with on my, on my Atlas. So I think this gives me a little bit more stability. I shot it in a long range match, which we won. Very stable. Other guys are running massive Phoenix bipods and stuff. We're rocking up with sky pods and a little game changer. And um, it's great. It's very stable. So if you have access to a sky pod and you can pick one up and you've got the funds, go for it. You're not going to go wrong with it. But a normal Atlas will do fine. And I think you'll be fine with the Picatinny mount too if you're predominantly doing groupings at 100 meters. Now, if you know, down the line you're going to be shooting some precision rifle stuff, uh, NRL matches, whatever the case may be, then I would suggest buying once and crying once and just get it over with. Guys that's it for all the questions today, I hope you enjoyed the video, a little bit different. We're probably going to do one of these every quarter that's specifically just for the guys on Patreon and you can basically ask me anything there. And uh, once again thanks everyone for supporting me there, thanks everyone for watching the video, always Make sure to leave a like, leave a dislike if you didn't like it or if you felt I dropped the ball on some of the questions. Let me know some of your feedback in the comments down below if you want to add to any of the questions and that will give some of the viewers some more context so we'd really appreciate that. Guys, I want to thank you for watching. Make sure you check out my favorite videos over here. Make sure you're subscribed over here and I will see you guys in the next video and uh, have a beautiful week. Stay safe out there and uh, yeah, thanks for watching. See ya.